We're at a place where the global system, I'd argue, is in the most tumultuous phase that it's been in, really since the, the early days leading into World War I. Um, and I say that because when I think about the big kind of upheaval socio, so, socially across societies, but also geopolitically, they really come in kind of two categories. One category are the kinds of internal developments inside societies that really change the way governments are. So you can think about uh, the, the Russian Revolution or the Communist Revolution in China or what's going on right now in the Middle East, where the governments are changing, the relationship, who has power in a society is changing. That's one category. A second category is when the relationship between states really changes. Um, and we've seen evidence of that in the past uh, multiple years. Um, particularly the best example that comes to mind is the role of the rise of the U.S. and the Soviet Union in, in, after World War II, and they're taking the mantle, both of our countries, as, a, as the two leading superpowers, as those examples. Um, but I'd argue that really this is the first time since the 1920s that we've kind of had both happening at the exact same time, right on top of each other. Um, and the implications are really profound when you think about it for what kind of society we're going to have, what kind of world we're going to have 20 or 30 years from now. I think it may be completely unrecognizable to pretty much all of us by then. I'm going to tell you why I actually think about the role of the U.S. as being really important in this era. And I actually am really upbeat, and I'll close with why I'm upbeat about in, at, at the end of this. Um, so uh, a couple reasons. Um, I think the U.S. is really essential to, to helping engineer what I call a soft landing for the global system. Um, and first is to recognize, it starts with a recognition that the U.S. is really instrumental in a stable world order. Um, you read everywhere about the decline of the United States. It's kind of you know, not that interesting, actually. And it's indisputably true that obviously other countries are growing economically and it's you know, the debate about whether it's good or bad, it doesn't really matter, it is what it is. Um, and yes, soon China's gonna have more of everything than the United States because they have a billion people and so they're gonna have more roads and yes, more solar panels and more engineers and all those things. They should have more of all those things because they're a big country, a lot bigger than ours. Um, but the more interesting question really is China itself or frankly any of these other growing powers, do they actually wanna be the global leader or a global leader? And I think it's a really open question. And the second question, which is even more interesting, is will the rest of the world accept them even if they want to? Um, because being an economic power alone is necessary, but certainly not sufficient to step into the, into the shoes that you would step into. And right now, I actually don't see any nation or frankly any set of nations that has the willingness, ability, and um, an acceptance on the rest of the part of the rest of the world to actually having that happen. Um, and let me talk a little bit about this kind of hidden role of the United States in uh, providing this world order. So today, uh, you know, the U.S. spends roughly 10 to 25 billion dollars a year um, protecting shipping lanes. That doesn't include the multiple billions of dollars we spend in the Middle East, ensuring that there's access to energy supplies. Um, but it's also little known things like NOAA's system of um, tsunami detection buoys, weather forecasting, um, <clears throat> and these tide level gauges that really provide the backbone of the entire Pacific Rim uh, tsunami warning, early warning system, which was triggered during the Japan earthquakes. Um, other countries contribute to it, but it's really the U.S. architecture mix of satellites and the rest that really is the backbone of all of that. Um, and if you ever really wanted to know about yield projections for things like Ukrainian rapeseed or Argentinian sunflower seed, it turns out the U.S. Department of Agriculture is where you go to. And you might think to yourself, who cares about rapeseed, really? Well, it turns out that... Um, Every year, there are about $2.5 trillion, trillion uh, commodity contracts that are written in this market, in the commodities markets. And so people are making a lot of money in this field, and a lot of people care a lot about those very things. Um, and so those are just a few of the what I call these hidden public goods that the United States provides. Um, I say they're hidden because we don't talk about them very much. Most people don't even know about them, and certainly nobody, else, everybody else in the rest of the world kind of takes them for granted. 
Um, and it's easy to forget. It's easy, I mean, who, who thinks about the buoy system in the Pacific Ocean? Um, this tsunami center has been operating in Hawaii since 1949. I'm sure it's a little sleepy backwater. Nobody pays any attention to it unless there's a big tsunami, but we've been footing the bill for it all along. So the problem we face today is that somebody's got to pay for all these public goods. And obviously, we're getting to a point where we can't pay for them unilaterally. Um, and I'd argue, even if the US were not digging out of this horrible recession where we have to wonder how we're going to pay for everything, it's this, you can't have this kind of free rider system going on forever. It's just unsustainable. And so uh, the world needs a more equitable burden sharing arrangement. We really do. Um, and it means that others, insisting that others step up, but the bit hardest thing for the United States to do, but I think we can do it, is actually giving up the control of trying to control the whole thing ourselves, um, which is one of the issues the United States has. Um, and so I think from a position right now where the U.S. is still providing the vast majority of these public goods is a perfect time to talk about, well, how do we spread this more equitably? How do we keep it sustainable? Do we really want to have a buoy system? I think we do, but let's figure out how everybody should pay for it and who wants to maintain it and all the rest of it. Um, second is the U.S. is really poised quite well to play a leadership role in shoring up these relatively weak multilateral institutions. Um, that are less and less capable of, of resolving any kind of conflict, frankly, um, and really not designed to stand the test of time. Um, I remember when Obama, I think he went to India on one of his early trips, and or maybe it was when the Indian prime minister came here, but a couple days before that, um, he announced our uh, support for a, a, a seat on the UN Security Council for India, and it was a big news item. Um, and I, I remember saying, you know, this is a body, right, that Japan and Germany aren't even, don't even have a seat at the table yet, right? This is, this is an organization that's supposed to help with international security, and yet the very countries who have the means and capacity to do just that not only aren't, you know, in the room with a veto, they're they can't, not even allowed to sit there and listen to the conversation. So uh, we have a major problem just in terms of who's at the table to try to help solve these problems. Um, and so the G20, which I think was a great innovation born out of a time of crisis, which some of the best organizations often are, um, is going to have a hard time, I think, because it's hard to reach consensus with five, six, seven people, much less 20. And in a non-crisis environment, it can be kind of hard. Um, but the encouraging thing is that you are starting to see slowly moves, right? The United States, we, we quietly said, okay, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't just have the G8 by itself anymore now that we have the G20. So we kind of put those two together. And let's try to figure out what we're going to do with the UN. So this, this is working. It just needs to be, there needs to be more of it and faster. Um, and a lot more of the same as we think about the next steps. Um, so you may think that I'm not optimistic after I say all this, but I promise that I'm ending on an optimistic note. Um, because I really am opt optimistic in a way, which is kind of uh, odd, I suppose. Um, because even though it, it turns out it's really difficult at a time of change to really marshal the energy and focus power in a concentrated way to say, this is what we want the new system to look like at the time that the old system is unraveling. It's just very, very difficult to do. Um, but I believe it really can be done. Um, it, because, and you, the G20 is a perfect example of that. It's born out of necessity um, because people really do want to collaborate with each other and people really do understand we have these problems that we can't solve by ourselves. Um, and so, um, you know, in the past also, I think there was this, for many, many hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, suspicion and distrust of across borders often led to war. Um, lots of calculations among power brokers about what, what their national interests were. And the citizenry was kind of left on the sidelines for, for a lot of that. Drug into wars that they probably never would have agreed to. Conflicts that lasted forever where the pea populace was really the victims. And so I think this advent of this peer-to-peer -peer technology where people can actually connect with each other directly and not through official mechanisms is probably the most important development in, in the way in the global system, certainly in our lifetime. These ties are really cross-cutting and multi-layered. 
everything from medical conferences that are cross-border online where people are sharing their medical research to online bridge clubs. This friend of mine participates in this online bridge club with people in like South Africa and Korea or something and they play in the middle of the night and you know, it's just amazing. Um, but it, it actually, what it does is it, it breaks down these barriers. You actually know somebody in a different country and when you know somebody, it's a lot harder to slide into conflict when you feel like you have a connection to those people. So I, I feel like it, it, it provides a natural break on what kind of governments left to their own devices might, might take societies. Um, and so I think we're in a period where we do, there's no real near-term fix to this problem of insecurity, but I, this swirl of change, I think, presents probably our best opportunity. Certainly it's gonna be in my lifetime, and I'd argue probably in the, in the, in the, in the last 100 years, to profoundly change the global system. And so I'm just going to close by saying, and I really just think for all of you as you think about your careers and what you want to do next, um, everybody's going to have to get into the game on this because it's not going to change itself on its own. Uh, we have a, this window of opportunity um, if people f marshal their forces to really make a profound difference. It does not come around every week. Um, and so we have to take advantage of it. And if we don't, we really risk kind of sliding into messy, chaotic, potentially tension and conflict-driven world in which really nobody will be better off. So um, with that, I will close, and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>